All right, we're going to be in Galatians 2, and we're doing uh, verses 11 to 21 uh, tonight. And so I'd encourage you to open your Bible to that place, uh, Galatians 2, verses 11 to 21. And uh, our goal is to cover all of that tonight. It is an intense text, so I want you to be prepared for that. Uh, this is one that you probably want to have your Bible open for sure. That's always true in Bible class, of course, but uh, particularly tonight, uh, you may find it hard to follow along if you don't. In fact, you may find it hard to follow along if you do have your Bible open. That may be my fault. But uh, we're going to work on this question, how can we rebuild what we tore down? We are in the middle of uh, this argument Paul is making. He starts with, and this is sort of a recap of where we've been, that Paul's gospel didn't originate with man or need human confirmation, even from the apostles. So that's kind of chapter 1. And then at the beginning of chapter 2, Paul tells a story about how Peter, James, and John vindicated Paul's gospel in their private meeting, even over the objections of some false brothers. So he didn't originate this gospel, didn't receive it from these other apostles, but the apostles did confirm it or vindicate it. Now, in this section, what we're covering tonight, uh, 11 to 21, it's really the last section that is about things Paul is recounting, events that he's describing and so we're going to get done with all of that, and he's going to launch into the actual arguments of the letter when we get to the beginning of chapter 3. But what we're going to talk about tonight is some events that Paul describes that further muddy the waters about whether Gentiles need to keep the law. And the, the muddy waters come from Peter himself, because after Peter gives Paul the right hand of fellowship and says, no, Gentiles don't need to keep the law. No, Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. Then Peter comes and does a flip-flop here in Antioch. So that's what we're going to read about tonight, that and then Paul's response to him, which I believe is the entirety of the rest of the chapter. So I'm going to read just to start uh, this section, verse 11 to 21. It says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. I hope you see that, uh, and we get in the muddy middle here, this is going to be some tough sledding. I want to prepare you for that. And uh, I want to, uh, the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to work us through verses 11 to 14 and then give you a chance to talk and then and ask questions and things. And then we're going to work through the rest of the chapter so if you have a question, I would ask that you wait until I'm done with my explanation, and then you can thoroughly question all my explanation. Uh, I'm sure that there will be some, uh, some questions about some of this. So uh, verse 11, he begins with this idea uh, of Cephas, when Cephas came to Antioch. And Cephas is Paul's name for Peter. It is the Aramaic name for Peter. It means rock, of course. And uh, remember back in verse 9, uh, he talked about how James and Cephas and John gave him the right hand of fellowship. So his flip-flop here is surprising, not only in light of verse 9, but also in light of the fact that Peter is the one who first goes and eats with the Gentiles in Acts 10. And then in Acts 11, some of the Jewish Christians questioned him about it, and Peter defended it and said, God was with us, the Holy Spirit came on them, an angel appeared to him, the Spirit told me to go, I had a vision, all these things that indicated God's approval. So it's, it's shocking, isn't it, when Peter, on one hand, is standing up to the other Jews... Now, the opposite happens. When he's there uh, without the Jews, he's going to eat with the Gentiles. But once the Jews come, he is going to um, flip-flop. Uh, we'll talk more about this statement a little later in the class. Uh, so Paul says, I withstood him to his face, 
or I opposed him to his face, is my version in verse 11, because he stood condemned. Uh, so that is as opposed to a quiet or private disagreement. You know, sometimes we have issues with each other that we go and talk, and we sit down and we have lunch or something. Uh, and then there are some issues that are, you know, deserved to, for whatever reason, be addressed publicly. And uh, at the very least, we'll talk a little bit about this later in the class, at the very least we can say it's a big deal. You know it's a big deal because Paul addresses it publicly before them all, and he is rebuking a, an apostle. So that's not something to be done lightly, uh, but to rebuke, a, a rebuke an apostle publicly is a big deal. Uh, he says he stood condemned, which is an extremely serious charge. He's not right with God. In fact, he is going to talk about, I believe, later in the, the chapter, about how this would make someone a transgressor. So you would be a sinner again, and condemned, of course, is a, a sin charge. So there's a lot going on here with what Peter is, uh, Paul is going to say about Peter. Verse 12, For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Okay, so he would eat with the Gentiles, which this is my reading of that. Presumably, in my judgment, that means he was violating both the kosher laws and the fellowship rules that attended Jewish observance of meals. So uh, when P Peter goes in Acts, Acts 10 and eats with Cornelius, they challenge him and said, you went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So it's the, the eating with them that indicates some kind of fellowship and endorsement. Also, most Jews believe that to eat with Gentiles would make you unclean. So Peter said, no, none of that's true. God cleansed their hearts by faith just like he did ours. No, I, it's okay for me to eat with them. But I'm also adding, I think this probably has to do with violating kosher rules too. Uh, I think at the very least that's suggested. And you may say, well, I don't see that, and that's fine. But that's the way I read it, that Peter was willing to eat with them with all that that would entail because they are Christians, Gentile Christians. But then when other Jewish Christians came from James, he refused to eat with them anymore. All right, so... Uh, I want to point out that this was especially important in Antioch. Antioch is the place where there are first Jews and Gentiles together. So just imagine if you are one of the first Gentile Christians in the whole world. Because there are no others at this according to Acts 11. Just Cornelius and the guys in Antioch. And so you're there and an apostle, one of the ones who walked with Jesus, the one who made the good confession, is there with you and he's at your table. He's eating in your house. He is having fellowship with you. And then imagine if other people came and he refused to come anymore. and said, I don't want anything to do with you. Imagine not only the impact that would have on the other Jewish Christians, but imagine on the other Gentile Christians. It would make a tremendous statement that you were unworthy to be in fellowship with someone who was a Jewish believer. So I believe that makes this an especially important thing and probably gives some of the heat to Paul's rebuke, because not only is this against the gospel, it's also having a tremendous detrimental impact on the church there. Okay, so uh, he says that these men came from James, which occasions a lot of uh, comment uh, there in verse 12. That can mean either formally representing James, or it may just be that they, they claim they're from James, or it may just be a statement that they're coming from Jerusalem. Uh, any of those are possible. I said see Acts 15, 24, because in Acts 15, they're at least claiming that they are coming from Jerusalem with the Jerusalem imprimatur, like Jerusalem agrees with us. And so that may be what's happening. Peter is intimidated because of some of those uh, representations. Paul also makes it clear that Peter's actions sprang from fear, not from conviction. He does not say you know what, I don't think this is right anymore. It says there in verse 12, he was fearing the circumcision or the Jews who had come. Okay, uh, so verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So just, I mean, imagine that, it's Peter. And if Peter makes a decision about something, the impact that's gonna have on the others who were there with him they're going to kind of fall in line. If Peter says this is not something we should be doing, then maybe we shouldn't do it either. So he has tremendous influence over the other Jewish believers. They all withdraw with him, even Barnabas. By the way, I just point out that even Barnabas is a compliment. You know how you might say, 
I could see so-and-so doing it, but even <laughs> Barnabas got caught up in it, which says, I would think better of Barnabas. I have a higher hopes for Barnabas, and yet even Barnabas is caught up. Uh, and Paul says plainly this is hypocrisy in verse 13. He says that a couple of different times, uh, and he'll explain why that is in just a minute. Verse 14, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So that word in verse 14 that in mine is translated in step with the truth of the gospel, uh, yours might have something like straightforward or in line. It's a very interesting word. It means to walk straight or walk according. It's the word from which we get orthopedics. And so it, walking uprightly. So he says there's a way that the gospel tells us to walk and their behavior in this instance shows they're not walking according to that standard. They're not walking straight. Uh, they're moving from side to side. They're wobbling a bit in their walk. Now, that last part of verse 14, which is the beginning of the rebuke, is a little bit, uh, a little bit mind-bending, a little bit difficult. Uh, so let me try. Let me give it a shot. Verse 14, if you, though a, Gen a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? I think what he is saying is, if Peter chooses to live like a Gentile by eating with them, okay, so he's eating with Gentiles as if there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, how can he force Gentiles to live like Jews by suddenly changing? Now he is living again by enforcing kosher and separation laws like he did prior to ever knowing Jesus. So if that's the case... He's sort of saying to the Gentiles, guys, you've got to become Jews if you want to have anything to do with me. So he says, how can that be? How is it possible if you know it's okay to live like a Gentile for you to tell Gentiles don't live like Gentiles and say you Gentiles need to start living like Jews and we Jews can live like Gentiles? What sense does that make? It doesn't get us anywhere. Uh, that, uh, the word force or compel, very interesting to me. Uh, that's in verse 14. Uh, if you... How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? It's the same word that in, back in verse 3 says that Titus was not forced to be circumcised. It's not talking about physical force, of course. It means that someone's not telling him, you have to do this to be right with God. Forcing them by binding it on them. So the issue in both of those cases is about binding rules on others when God doesn't. Peter, I don't know if you realize it, Paul says, but you are forcing people to live in a way that's not consistent with what God has told them. You're binding things God hasn't bound. You're forcing Gentiles to live like Jews when you know God doesn't. You know how we know Peter knows that? Because he gave Paul the right hand of fellowship back in verse 9. He knows that. He also went into Cornelius' house. He knows that. And yet now he's not consistent with what he knows. He is forcing them to live like Jews. Okay, this is kind of summarizing what I've said. Peter's example sends the message that the Gentiles have to live like Jews to become a part of the people of God. The word is actually Judaize, which is a word in the Greek translation of Esther is used to describe the people wanting to become Jews because they're afraid of the Jews who are going to come attack them after the edict is reversed. I know we haven't gotten there in our Esther class on Sunday mornings, but, uh, but we will. It's the same word to Judaize. Okay, so uh, I think that what comes next, verse 15 to 21... Uh, there is a little dispute about where the quotations begin and end, because after all, what we just read is Paul's words to Peter, right? So where does that end? Does it end here? Well, we don't have quotations in the ancient manuscripts. Um, so I believe that the whole chapter, the whole rest of the chapter is Paul's words to Peter. Uh, other people disagree, but that's the way I'm going to operate from this point forward. Questions, comments on 11 to 14. I know I went through that fast. It's because there's more to come. Yes, ma'am. Peter is such a picture of contradictions. You know, one minute he's declaring Jesus the Son of God, and the next minute he's waffling on compelling the Gentiles, and it makes it seem odd unless God is using it to show us how to deal with things that we don't agree with, that Peter's not didn't quite get the inspiration that the rest of them have, and he's more like us, really. Yes. I do think it's very much fitting with Peter's character, both in the, the, the way he can kind of be all in and then all out, 
Uh, I'm also thinking of the night he denies Jesus. Um, there is a peer pressure factor there, too, um, where he, he is concerned about the consequences of what other people are going to say or do if he, if he follows through on what he knows is true. What's interesting is, in Acts 11, he treats it completely differently. He stands up to these same people, but now he waffles. And, uh, but, but definitely, I do think there's something to be said for Peter's example. He's not a perfect man. And I think we relate to him in that. I think that's good. Uh, but it also means that he's not to be, it, it is not his example that is always inspired as he is rebuked, frankly, for that year. Yeah. Bill? So you and I have talked a little bit before about Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, where it wasn't just circumstances that answered the question. They actually held on to certain Judaism things about food, and here we are again in this, as part of this context, that same thing, just showing their struggle with where they were going to land. You know, right. like, I, I, these are inspired, it, it, it struggle for me because these are inspired men, but they don't, they don't seem to be landing in a concrete position here. At this stage, they're not, yeah. I do think I, I, my conviction is that at Galatians 2 is prior to Acts 15. So I think this is part of what leads up to the meeting. In fact, one of the ways, I'll say this in a minute, but one of the ways I think Peter, I know Peter accepts Paul's rebuke is because of where Peter comes down in Acts 15. In fact, if you study Peter's speech in Acts 15, it's almost exactly Galatians 2, 14 to 21. It's almost exactly what Paul says to him. Uh, we believe that we'll be saved by the grace of Jesus, just like they will. Uh, he's, he's mirroring what Peter says. So I think, I think Paul listens. But it is interesting. It is not that Paul doesn't, I mean, that Peter is wrong in what he is teaching. It's that Peter is not living up to what he knows. And that's why Paul is rebuking him. You're not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel. There is, you know better, Peter. And I think that's the nature of the rebuke. Now, there's teaching that goes along with it because I don't think Peter realizes how his actions are betraying his convictions. But I don't think he is saying, Peter, you, mm, mm, mm. I don't think it's as much a teaching problem at this stage. Okay, other comments, questions? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Rachel. I just, when you think about Peter... Um, Peter is inspired just as much as all the other apostles. It's not that any of them were less or, not, or more. And he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He can, and he even has the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. But God does not control him. And that's where, like when we talk about, we also, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we're baptized, mm -hmm. we have that salvation and that renewal and that refreshing. But that doesn't mean God controls us. He didn't control. If God controlled people, he would have controlled Peter in this instance. We still choose to follow God or not. And that shows that we're being led by the Spirit. And even how you said, Peter does respond to Paul's criticisms. And Paul is, I mean, Peter is going to be, Peter is led by the Spirit def, despite his faults and failures just like we have them. We can still be, we're led by the Spirit. Right. Absolutely, and, and we need to know the difference there uh, between the Holy Spirit taking over and the Holy Spirit helping us. Uh, I ha had a brother explain it to me as the Holy Spirit is like power steering. Uh, the, the directions you want to go and the things you want to do, the Spirit can make you stronger and can help you in that, but it's not autopilot where he takes over. Uh, I like that picture. Cole? I was going to say something about the public review, rebuke because I just feel like that's a... You know, that's something I f honestly don't think we ever do, first of all, uh, publicly re rebuke people. But um, I also feel that, I mean, Peter was a teacher. And I think those who teach, if they don't practice what they teach, that is when it's called to be publicly rebuked. I mean, because that's, I think that's why it was such a serious thing is because, I mean, if you were, do if you're up here telling us all this, Jacob, and then you're not practicing it, I think it's totally right for another teacher to call you out on it. And it or whoever. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. No, you, you, are, you leave yourself open when you are a public representative of that. I don't think uh, there is a clear, like Paul doesn't explain, this is why I'm rebuking him publicly. Uh, and I think 
I don't think it's wise to put our words in Paul's mouth about that. Mm -hmm. But let's just say it this way. We can see the impact Peter's actions have on his other Jewish believers who follow him. Uh, We can imagine what it's like on the Gentile believers who are hurt by him. And now also, if Paul doesn't rebuke him, then even the Galatians could be led astray. And people could say, look, Peter, even Peter doesn't have anything to do with Gentiles. So you can see how the tendrils of that can go out. And I think that affects the way that can be addressed. It's not a personal matter where Paul said, Peter, I don't like what you said to me or about me. It's very much more a gospel type issue. Right, and I guess the the thing that I was thinking about this is I sometimes like I don't want us to take it so far that, you know, we have a new convert and he just messes up and then you public <laughs> review him. That's I think this is a very specific situation. That's kind of yeah. why I was also bringing it up. Right. So. Absolutely. And uh, there's a passage 1 Thessalonians 5:14 talks about different groups of people and the different approaches we take with each. You know, help the weak, admonish the idle, comfort the faint-hearted, be patient with them all. You know, that, that we need some discernment about what am I dealing with? Is someone in a rebellious way? And that affects how I approach them. There's wisdom and discernment needed in that. Uh, Curtis? Uh, I, I agree with most of what Cole said. I think uh, we, sh- we sure need to be careful about a public rebuke of anyone. That uh, creates a situation that uh, is, uh, makes it difficult for someone to back out and do right. Uh, I remember I was in a situation one time when I was in high school. There was a fellow who was a brand new convert in Bible class like this. He made a comment about something that just made you smile. It was one of those things that it was the, it was the wrong, right answer to the wrong question. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, though. He went through commentaries that next week after the preacher had rebuked him publicly and he found somebody that agreed with him. And instead of becoming a learner then, he became an advocate for a position that wasn't the right one. However, I do believe that uh, public rebuke is necessary when the, when the sin like this is public. It's a situation in which you'd never have that group of people gathered together again exactly under those circumstances, and if someone decided, well, listen, I'll go by the, by the rules of Matthew 18 and uh, handle, that, handle that quietly and privately, you'll have people who leave that group with the wrong impression about what's right. So if, if uh, let us suppose I was up here preaching and I preached that baptism wasn't uh, essential for the forgiveness of sins, I would expect the preacher and the elders and anybody else who wasn't here to say, listen, Brother Pope, I love you, I care about you, but that's not true according to the scriptures, and here's why. Uh, most of the time, we have a pattern in Matthew 18. I think when we see a public situation like this, it's one that requires a public rebuke. Mm-hmm. I think um, there can be a, there are some situations like you're talking about where I do think there may be some reading of how you, you've got a new believer. And, uh, and by the way, I just want to say this in the hearing of our whole group. Sometimes we have new believers, and new believers say things that are not 100% right. And there needs to be a patience and a kindness and a gentleness with them, understanding that. And uh, we, we need to be able to, to give a little on that, not because we're giving on the gospel, but because we care about them. And they can have that same, uh, it can spur something in them that's unhealthy. Um, but on the other hand, truth is truth, and, uh, and especially when we see damage done, uh, when something like this happens that damages so many, and Peter's great influence has a big uh, part to do with that. I think you can see why a, a public rebuke is appropriate. But Dick? Is this horse, horse dead yet? Um, why don't I, you kill it for us? I know, <laughs> I, I know, of, a, know of a situation where uh, one of the influential deacons um, said some things, did some things from the pulpit, and uh, it really sort of pointed off in the wrong direction. Not, not flagrant, but uh, off tone. And um, before the assembly went very much further, one of the shepherds came to the front and made some, uh, I think, carefully worded correcting comments that didn't sit well with the deacon who had got, found himself in the crosshairs uh, but it was a teachable moment for the flock, mm-hmm. and it and it was a judgment call, yep. and I th- I think in so many cases a judgment call is going to f- 
figure in. Right. And so we can't throw the book open and point at something and say, this has to happen right now. Right. But for, for Peter's situation, it was an important uh, data point for those who were seeing and hearing what's going on in a brand new um, economy, yep. the church getting started. So I think it's fair for him to be rebuked in the same public way that he committed things. Yeah. Paul knows, Paul knows he's got Gentiles to preach to. And uh, if Gentiles get wind of this, it's going to destroy them. Uh, and think about how he's standing up for them back in chapter 2, verse 3, 4, 5. So uh, let me just say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward, uh, but I, I want to give a final word on that. The, the, the place in 1 Timothy 5 that mentions um, elders who are sinning uh, publicly and rebuke in the presence of all, um, that to me is, that's, a, that's a, okay. That's something that needs to be done. Um, short of that, I think we're going to have a, some, some judgment. I think we're going to have some judgment. And judgment has to do with the person. Judgment has to do with the situation uh, and the audience. Uh, judgment has to do with the effect. There's a lot that goes into judgment. I would say uh, I don't, uh, especially sometimes people will tell me about a situation. And, uh, you know, we always have all the answers for other people's situations. Those are so easy, right? Uh, but uh, I think it's, it's challenging to say what should have happened. I think instead we need, to, we need to try to balance those two things. I want to keep the truth and worry about the impact of that on other people. But at the same time, I want to be sure I'm dealing with the person who's making the, the error in a way that's appropriate to their spiritual life. Okay, I need to keep going. Uh, verse 15. So I, I think this is continuing the rebuke of Peter. It says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, verse 16 in my version, the ESV, is a really, really long sentence, so I'm going to break it up a little bit. Um, first of all, I want you to see that uh, Paul is referring to his and Peter's common experience as Jewish believers. He keeps saying we, we ourselves, we know, we too. I think he is saying, look, Peter, we're on the same team, and we believe the same thing, and we came to this the same way. He says in verse six, uh, 15, we're Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. That doesn't mean that Gentiles are bad and Jews are not sinners. He means there's a difference in the spiritual background and upbringing and experience of Jews and Gentiles, right? Okay, a Jew is raised in a certain way, believes certain things, knows certain things about God, knows certain things about the law. A Gentile is notoriously not. So there is a difference. But his point is not about the difference. His point is about the similarity. In verse 16, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're Jews by birth, and yet you and I, Peter, we know. We know better than that. We grew up doing the works of the law, and yet we know that those works don't save anybody. We know that. Do you hear him? He's hammering on their commonality, and he is saying, you already agree with this, Peter. That's what you've been preaching. You have not been going around preaching, everybody keep Torah. You kept it your whole life. Peter's the one who says, I've never eaten anything common or unclean, but, but now he has changed. Why has that change come? Paul says that's because you know that, um, sorry, you know that we can't be saved by works of the law. So Peter and Paul both believe that being a Jew alone does not save because works of the law cannot save. That's what they both know, and that's what they agree. Uh, the reason, uh, and I want to keep reading in verse 16, it says... <coughs> So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So works of the law cannot save us. Doing the works of the law cannot save us. I want to think a little bit about why Paul says that. I think part of it is that the law must be kept completely and perfectly, meaning you can't just keep one piece of the law and expect God to say, that was good, that's good enough. If you want to keep the law, and they'll say this in chapter 5, you are a debtor to keep the whole law. You want to keep the circumcision part? Congratulations, now you get to keep the rest. And in chapter 3 and verse 10, he quotes from the law, which says, uh, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. If you're going to keep the law, keep all things, or else cursed. So that's the way the law works. And we know that practically. If you read the law of Moses, you see all those laws. And then you see, okay, yes, there is a, a sacrifice idea 
But it is not the idea that we're going to be saved from sin and death by that sacrifice. It is instead the law consistently convicts us over and over again, year after year, maybe even day after day. That is the nature of living under the law. Peter will say, it's like a yoke that neither we nor our fathers were ever able to bear. So works of the law are not going to save us. So uh, if this is untrue, if works of the law can save us, then there's no need for Jesus to die for us. We could have just done the work and saved ourselves. He'll come to that later in the chapter uh, in 221. Yet that's not what Paul and Peter believe. They don't think you can do enough works. And so that's where they have started. That's their common ground. They have believed in Christ Jesus instead of continuing to keep the law. So the fact that Peter was willing to eat with the Gentiles before, that should be 2.12, by the way. Uh, Peter was willing to eat with the Gentiles before shows that Peter agrees. If Peter's still living under the law, why did he eat with the Gentiles? Why did he go to Cornelius' house? Why? If he was living under the law, he should have avoided all of that. But that's not what he did. So Paul's saying, look, Peter, you know better than what you're doing now. That's why you were doing the opposite a minute ago. All right, verse 17, where it gets a little thorny. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. All right, this is probably not the only time I'll ever put this, but I wouldn't have put it on the slide. Just so we all know, this is a difficult verse. Verse 17. See it? This is a difficult verse. All right, so here's what I think it's saying. And I want you to flow with me through this. And if you disagree, I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, my reading is that if Paul and Peter abandon the Jewish covenant and cross lines to eat with Gentiles, that's the first part. In our endeavor to be justified by Christ, we were found to be sinners. So we cross the line and the law would condemn us. We're sinning by eating with these Gentiles. Does that mean, like a Jewish believer might think, Christ is prompting us to sin? You know, since we now believe in Jesus, now we're crossing these lines and going to eat with Gentiles. We're sinners now. And of course, he says, God forbid. That's not what makes us a sinner. Verse 18, if I rebuild what I tore down, then I prove myself to be a transgressor. That's what makes me a sinner, is that God acted, something changed, and I tore down who I used to be, and the walls that divided us from Gentiles fell down And yet now, now that I'm on the other side of that change, I'm going back to rebuild what I used to be. I'm going back to the old kosher way. I'm going back to not have anything to do with my fellow believers. That's what makes me a transgressor, the flip-flopping. So that's what I think Paul is arguing to Peter. He is saying, no, it's not a sin for you to do what you've been doing. It's a sin for you to go back to what you used to do and used to be since now you know better. Um, Okay. Uh, There are some other interpretations of these verses which uh, center around this idea of how are we found to be sinners in verse 17. I won't uh, get into all of those, although if you you believe one of them, feel free to offer it. Uh, But I just want to say it this way. The thrust of the passage, as I understand it, is that Christ will not lead us to do something that's against God's will, even if it appears to contradict the Torah. Okay, Jesus fulfills Torah. But if you come to Jesus and say, no, I can't have anything to do with other people you accept because of Torah, then you're misunderstanding Torah and you're following works of the law over Jesus. So we hear what he's saying about Peter. Peter, you're going back to what you tore down, and that's not appropriate. So think about it this way. Rebuilding what he tore down would mean admitting that his initial acceptance of Gentiles was a transgression. That was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. Now he's repenting. And it would also deny what God is doing now in the Spirit-led community of believers. I mean, after all, the Spirit is with them. They're doing miracles in the presence. Gentiles have the Holy Spirit. Gentiles are accepted by God. So are you going to say, God, you're wrong, and we should go back to pure Judaism? Is that what we should be thinking? That's rebuilding what you tore down. That's what Paul is rebuking Peter about. Okay, verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. All right, so that verse mirrors, and we don't have time for it tonight, but Romans 7, 4 is almost an exact uh, mirror of that. When we died to Christ, we died to the law, which condemned our behavior. So it was like this, especially if you were a Jew. The Jew would say, you're a sinner and you need salvation. But it didn't provide the way of that salvation. It was only in Christ that the way of that salvation became clear. So 
When you came to Christ, you died and you were buried and you were raised to walk in new life. You died, and in dying, you died to the law. So Paul says, Peter, you're dead to the law. Don't go back and rebuild what you died to. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So there is a life. Do you see it? I am now alive. I died with Christ, and now I'm alive again. But that life is through faith, not through working the law. So something has fundamentally changed. Our former selves, our former wills have been crucified, and a new life has begun in which old things don't fit. The things we used to do, who we used to be, what we tore down. We don't rebuild it. We don't go back to it. We have new life in Christ. I put on here uh, the new wineskins idea because I think it's at least worth considering that when Jesus says new wine needs new wineskins, there's at least a possibility that what he's saying, because he's talking about things that don't fit, that maybe we're talking about a similar idea here, that who you are now doesn't fit who you used to be. There's been a change. All of Galatians is permeated with the logic that something has changed. And if it's changed, don't go back to where you were before the change. Uh, This life is prompted by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me rather than obedience and hope of earning salvation. I'm not saying obedience is a problem. I'm saying obedience and hope of earning salvation is a problem. There's a difference in walking by faith motivated by someone who loved me and sacrificed himself for me and operating under a system of laws by which if you keep them perfectly, you get to exchange that for one salvation. That difference is what Paul is highlighting. Peter, which side are you on? You've gone back. Verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So seeking righteousness through keeping the law, he says, would nullify the grace of God. What he means is it would make God's grace unnecessary. You don't need God's grace because, after all, you can earn it yourself. So... um, Yeah, I don't need to say all that. Uh, Something new is afoot in Christ. I really want to drive this into our way of thinking. Because I'm not sure we think this way. But Paul is saying, look, everything changed at the cross. Everything changed there. Before faith came, you were under a tutor. But when faith came, when the fullness of time come, God sent forth his son to redeem us, to adopt us as sons, to make us new. How can you go back? And what he's going to say to the Galatians is the same thing he says to Peter. How can you go back and become a slave again of what Jesus died to set you free from? All right. Uh, so let's say this. We don't read about Peter's response, but I believe we can assume their agreement based on later positive references. These are all of Paul's references to Peter just in 1 Corinthians that are positive. He doesn't say, and Peter, that scumbag who doesn't understand the gospel. You know, he talks about Peter in a kind way and in an approving way. Uh, He and Peter are co-workers. Peter also seems convinced because his own argument in Acts 15, 7 to 11, this is what I was saying earlier when Phil made his comment, uh, reflects Paul's words here strongly. I think think he is borrowing some of Paul's wording when he expresses himself in Acts, which is a very interesting By the way, incidental agreement of two documents, Acts and Galatians, that uh, are not written by the same author. Okay, I have about five minutes. So, anybody have any comment? Okay, let's do it quick. Who we got? Brother Randy? Yeah, I uh, I agree with you. Fifteen... It seems that Peter almost quotes Paul uh, in what he said. But in 7, I find it almost amusing, certainly interesting, that Peter uh, says that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Peter, more than a flip-flop, he stands up and says, it's me. Right. I'm the guy that did this, and he's pounding his chest about it. And now he's, yeah, he's uh, waffling on that. In your uh, 
scriptures when you got to Galatians 3.10, I think you've got to read 3.11 as well. If there had been a law given that could give life, right. uh, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. Mm -hmm. And you have to substitute the word righteousness with justification. Right. That's what the law couldn't do. Right. In that sense and that meaning of using the term righteousness, it means the Jews are not justified by the law, but their faith in law keeping uh, allowed them to receive the benefits of Christ's sacrifice. And so it's a, it's a common faith between Peter where you came from and Peter where you are now and the Gentiles they're, they're here now in that so they're justified by faith I just think that uh, I can't understand all of this until I understand the third chapter right right I agree I think there's more that will shed some light on that alright last one who we got Ms. Trish there is a lot of Judaism that is not religion it's culture right and nobody ever said they had to give up their culture. I mean, the way they passed down their belongings and the way that a widow was taken care of, those things, they were welcome to continue. It was just the binding right. by the Jews onto the Gentiles what God wasn't binding. Right. That's the main issue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that here in just a second. I want to I think about this idea of rebuilding what we tore down because I want to think about how you and I can do that. Um, I think one way we can do that is to go back to our old way of living. I'm thinking about us as believers, as Christians. We have a way of living that we used to have, and Peter talks about it with the uh, false teachers, like a dog going back to his vomit. You know, you, you've escaped the pollutions of the world, you've been cleansed, and then you go back and you wallow in the mire again. That idea of what I used to be and what I used to do can look appealing, uh, especially if we're having a hard time in a spiritual life. Uh, and I think the same kind of arguments would work here. Don't rebuild what you tore down. Uh, we make decisions out of fear of people rather than conviction. Uh, that's what Peter does here. Um, I'm not convinced that this is what's right. It's just something I'm scared of what other people are going to say. And because of that, I end up doing things that are my old way. You know, when we get into pressure situations, sometimes we default to our old habits. This is what is more natural to me. This is what I've always done. And I think that's what Peter does. I'd rather just go, it's just easier for me if I just back out of this situation because standing up for what's right would be hard here. And so he ends up rebuilding what he tore down. Uh, we equate walking with Jesus with perfection and earning our place. I think sometimes that's a particular Jewish uh, perspective uh, that we're going to earn our way and that we're going to be deserving of something. Uh, but I do think that that's a way people in modern times think. If you talk to unbelievers, you talk to non-Christians, and you ask them whether someone is going to go to heaven or not, what's their standard? They will say, yeah, yeah, they're a pretty good person. It's the same idea. If you're a pretty good person, then you go to heaven. And that's not the way God works. That's not the way the law worked in the Old Testament. It's not the way it works in the New Testament. It's not the way it ever has worked. And yet, that's sort of the same idea. We are going to battle that mentality that says, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? Have I made my way? Have I earned my place? And that's a way we rebuild what has been torn down. The last thing is we bind things on others that God has not bound. That we end up saying, you need to do what I think you need to do. Not what God has said. That's a different issue, and that's the, the preaching of the truth. This is about, I get to make the rules for you. Okay, so I'm going to give, um, i got about 30 seconds here. I'm going to give you some applications. I know I'm rushing here. And I apologize to those of you who are taking notes. Um, I want to say, uh, this kind of goes back to our discussion about rebuking. Uh, we need courage to be able to challenge one another. Imagine the courage it took to challenge Peter. But we also need discernment to know the appropriate ways and times to do that. And if we have one without the other, we'll make a mess. And if we have the other without the courage, then we end up not doing what we should do. Hypocrisy can have a dramatic, <laughs> devastating impact. I think you've probably seen this. I think you've probably experienced it from others. Uh, but it has an impact on the people who are on your team, and it has the impact on the people who are not on your team. Think about Peter's influence. Think about what people were thinking about Peter as he did this. They're going to follow Peter, or they're going to be offended by Peter. His hypocrisy has an impact. Ours does too. Uh, binding what God has not bound, and then threatening to withhold fellowship, which is what Peter does here, forces people in a way that is inconsistent with the gospel. 
I want us to think about that. And you just take that home and chew on that. We all have our ways of doing things that we think are best or think are appropriate. But when we say something is wrong that God has not said it's wrong, we're overstepping our authority. And when we say something is right that we don't know from God is right, we're overstepping our authority. And when we then try to force other people to do it by saying, you have to do this, this is the way. When we don't have word from God, we are forcing people. That's the word, compelling. And that is not what the gospel is. That's not the way spiritual living should work. That's what gets Paul's hackles up. You can't do that to people because you will end up causing them to make a decision that's not really about Jesus at all. Okay, two more and I'm done. Love motivates differently from rules. That's at the end of the chapter where he talks about Jesus' love for us, how he gave himself for us. And then Christian faith begins with crucifying ourselves. I have been crucified with Christ and that's the beginning of my walk. All right, thank you so much.